I welcome you to the sixth in the series of Come and Be Revived, a series of six talks on social justice in partnership with the readers in Chester Diocese and with us, Chester Cathedral. And today we're welcoming the Reverend Lynn Cullins, Rector of Stockport and Brinnington, and the Reverend Dr. Al Barrett, Rector of Hodge Hill Church, Birmingham. And they're going to speak on a Christian response to UK poverty. But before I hand over to them, and I understand they're going to have 10 minutes each and then we'll have questions and discussions, I'd like to pray. So let us pray. Loving God, open our eyes to the needs of those around us, to those across the world, to those in the UK, and to those who live next door to us. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who died for us. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lynn and Al, for joining us and preparation beforehand. I shall hand over to both of you. Wonderful. Thank you, Jane. It's really lovely to be with you this afternoon. Can you hear me OK, everybody? Yeah, brilliant. See, thumbs up. That's fabulous. Thank you. Huge thanks um, to Jane, to the diocese, to Chester Cathedral, both for facilitating this important series of discussions on social justice, which is wonderful, and, and also for the invitation to Al and me to take part and to share some thoughts on a Christian response to UK poverty. Um, I'm really delighted that Al's been able to join us today. He's parish priest, theologian, author. It's easier to say the things he isn't really, but he has insights which have really challenged and excited me over the years of our friendship. And most recently via the book that he mentioned earlier, and I'm hopeful that he'll mention again soon, being interrupted that he's co-authored with Ruth Harley and is about to be released so um, I hope he will mention that again shortly. So um, so my name's Lynn, I am Rector of the Parish of Stockport and Brinnington. I'm also involved in some national work but the things that kind of drive me and that I have a passion for and feel called to are issues of poverty, inequality, disadvantage, perhaps most especially from the perspective of class um, and I'm also um, really interested in church culture. So um, I'm going to kick off for the next few minutes on my personal interpretation of a Christian response to UK poverty. I think it's a key week to be considering this. Um, I'm sure many of you will have seen a few days ago the report that was published by the National Churches Trust. Um, which set a financial value on services and support that churches provide and on the benefits of the improved health and well-being they create. And that financial value was 12.4 billion a year, 12.4 billion pounds a year. That's an absolutely astounding figure and one that's clearly made the world sit up and take notice. And See this morning on social media various politicians from all quarters joining zoom gatherings with church leaders to thank them for their contribution um, so let's begin publicly by acknowledging that contribution as christians as church we're already responding magnificently to the day-to-day -day issues raised by domestic poverty one of the five marks of mission is to respond to human need by loving service. And there we have 12.4 billion pounds worth of loving service being provided every single year. But how do we articulate that as part of an overall Christian response? How do we frame that within our broader calling to challenge issues of poverty? Well, um, I'm going to share with you a little story. I like stories. I think Christ showed that he likes stories too. So I'm going to tell you a story that I think has some relevance in framing this. I heard a journalist on the radio recently who had interviewed the American basketball player Kobe Bryant just before his really tragic death with his daughter in that helicopter crash earlier this year. Brian, as you may well know, was um, a top NBA player. 
He was an Olympic gold medal winner. He was one of the most decorated players of all time. And the journalist had heard that Bryant undertook a two hour workout week each day, a, a really grueling two hour workout. And he asked Bryant if he could watch it. Of course, meet me at the gym at four, he said. And the journalist replied that he was busy that afternoon. And Bryant said, no, four in the morning. So the following morning, the journalist arrived at quarter to four and found Brian already working out. He sat down to watch him and he was absolutely amazed to find that for a whole hour, Brian practiced the most basic footwork moves, the moves that children of primary school age, of elementary school age, had already mastered over and over again. Brian went through his footwork, never once looking up. And at the end of the session, the journalist spoke to him and he asked him why he, one of the most successful and experienced players of all time, had spent so long going through such basic moves. And Bryant replied that he did that every day for a whole hour. You see, he says, you must never tire of the footwork. You must never tire of the basics because all else is built on the basics. I absolutely love that. I think that's kind of an image and an analogy for so many things we get involved in. So what are the basics in a Christian route to UK poverty? What do we need to build on and do tirelessly? So the first basic that we need to build on, I think, is prayer. Our response must be built both as individuals and as church on prayer. Prayer changes the world around us. Prayer changes us too. So we must pray. But we must not just pray. We must recognize that we are also each potential answers to prayer. Many, many thousands of Christians are clearly offering themselves week in, week out as answers to prayer in their local communities within that 12.4 billion pound figure that I mentioned a few moments ago. But I'd like us to think about whose prayers are we answering? The prayers we should be answering are the prayers of the poor and the disadvantaged. So what might their prayers be? Do they pray that they might be given access to support from the food bank? Or do they pray not to need a food bank? And do we take time to listen to their deeper yearnings, the yearning for transformation, the yearning for dignity, the yearning for life opportunities? So another basic to build on, and of which we must not tire in a Christian response to UK poverty, I would say is again, one of our five marks of mission that we're called to transform unjust structures of society to transform them. So alongside supporting those experiencing the effect of and the fallout from those unjust structures and policies and approaches and mindsets, we mustn't tire of the footwork of challenging the causes of poverty, of deprivation and of marginalization. We must not tire of that magnificent sense of God's raising of the poor and the powerless and the voiceless. And nor must we be negligent of our role in acting as gateways within that. So that includes, I think, beginning with ourselves and our own structures as church. We need to begin by removing the log from our own eye before we seek the splinter elsewhere. So who's on your PCC, for instance? And more importantly, who isn't? Who makes decisions in our diocese, on General Synod, in the House of Bishops? And whose voices are missing? And I think, too, we each need to recognise our own agency in that process. When you're asked to speak on a panel, present at a conference, take up a promotion, sit in the chair, should it really be you? And I issue that challenge 
frequently to myself as I do to anyone else. I was absolutely delighted the other day to offer someone the option of taking up a role in a national group. And the person asked me, who else is involved? Am I taking up a place that someone from an underrepresented group could have instead? And I think that's an absolutely fantastic question and exactly the sort of response each of us are capable of giving. We need not only to serve the needs of the, the poor, but to use our agency to raise up a broader range of voices and leaders because we're not called to maintain unjust systems, we're called to transform them. And the day-to-day -day action each of us takes in amplifying voice, in encouraging broader representation and leadership will transform in a way that simply meeting need never will. And though we're very much still on the journey on this, I'm delighted to see that happening within the church. There are broader processes for selection, a desire to see estates leadership and working class leadership encouraged and supported, the active designing in of a range of voices into senior strategic groups and processes, and the outward looking focus of a growing number of churches in meeting wider housing and community need. So in summary, and before I hand over to Al, my sense, is that a Christian response to UK poverty requires us to stay with the footwork, to stay with the basics, because all else is built on that. So let's pray. Let's see ourselves as answers to prayer. Let's seek to understand the prayers of others. Let's continue the vital work of loving service, responding to human need in our communities across the country. And let's continue to challenge the unjust structures which create the environment that makes much of that service necessary. And let's see ourselves and our church as at the forefront of that response, using our own agency in whatever way we can and whatever that looks like, modeling and witnessing to our faith and our commitment to transformed lives and transformed communities through the power of the Holy Spirit and the agency of a transformed church. So that's my two pennies for what it's worth. And I'm going to hand over now to Al. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I want to, to pick up on where Lynn has, has launched us off and try and take it a little bit further in one direction. Lynn asks the question, whose voices are being heard? And I want to turn that round for a moment and ask who is doing the hearing or indeed the not hearing. I came across this quote the other day from the Indian author Arundhati Roy, who says, there's really no such thing as the voiceless. There are only the deliberately silenced or the preferably unheard. There's really no such thing as the voiceless. There are only the deliberately silenced or the preferably unheard. And Arundhati Roy's quote reminds me of the aftermath of the Grenfell fire tragedy. When in the hours and days after the fire that killed 70 people, it became apparent that residents of Grenfell Tower had been issuing warnings for months, if not years, that the building in which they lived their home was unsafe. They had been issuing warnings on blogs and on the internet, as well as in person in meetings, saying they believed that only a catastrophic event, an event that meant the loss of life, would potentially wake their landlords up to the responsibilities that they were uh, negating, that they were negligent of. And a few months after the fire, the journalist John Snow, in a lecture to other journalists, offered what sounded and looked 
and felt like a heartbreaking lament. Why didn't we know, he said. Why didn't we hear those voices, those warnings? And the answer he offered was that we, and he spoke for journalists, but I suspect he speaks for quite a lot of us, we are too far removed. We're not in close enough contact to be able to hear those voices. Or we actively choose to shut our ears to them. Our society and our economy separate us from each other. It's in the interests of the way our politics works to divide us against each other. And divisions of class are pernicious and divisions of race intersect with them. And they build up in some of us resistances to encounter, to encountering our neighbors, our fellow citizens, our sisters and brothers in the body of Christ even. They build up resistances to our being able to hear those warnings, those challenges, those prayers of which Lynn spoke. And I want to suggest that in our two most common responses to poverty as Christians, there are dangers of entrenching those resistances, of keeping the walls built, of maintaining the divisions and the gaps between us so that we still don't hear those cries, those warnings, those challenges and those prayers. So the first common response of Christians to poverty is the response of cha charity, of giving to poor people, of giving to those who are vulnerable or on the edges. It can reduce suffering, it can sometimes save lives, yes, but it treats people as individuals, it keeps their problems individualised too. It doesn't, as Lynn highlighted already, address the root causes that keep people in poverty, that keep pushing people to the edges and off the edges of our society. And so a second response that Christians commonly engage in when they realize that charity doesn't do everything is the response of advocacy, of speaking for those on the margins. It's, um, it's about public statements and protests of lobbying, organizing and marching in the streets. It's concerned with the causes and not just the symptoms. It's rooted in the prophetic tradition of the Hebrew Bible. And yet, as Methodist theologian Jörg Rieger says, too many advocates assume that they are somehow above or unaffected by the problem, merely seeking to help others who are less fortunate, the privileged supporting the underprivileged. The danger of those two approaches is that both of them are about doing for or speaking for others. And in the process of doing for or speaking for others, we shut ourselves, we shut our ears to their voices. We shut our eyes to their agency. And so after charity and advocacy, I want to suggest a third response, one of deep solidarity, one of standing with and living with our neighbors who are so often othered from us. Deep solidarity, says Jörg Rieger again, describes a situation where the 99% of us who have to work for a living develop some understanding that we're in the same boat. Deep solidarity not only thrives on differences, it also brings to light otherwise hidden privileges and helps deconstruct them. As we develop power together by putting our differences to productive use, we begin to realize that those who are forced to endure the greatest pressures might have the most valuable lessons to teach us. So how do we do this? Well, I think, and I speak for myself here, those of us in positions of multiple privilege in our society, particularly where class and race, as well as things like gender and ability, intersect. People like me need to learn to let go of our centralness. 
of our sense that we're the people to fix things. We're the people to be center stage. We're the people whose voices matter. And we need to move to the edges, perhaps often literally to the edges. It's about relocation. It's about resistance also. People like me need to learn to resist those temptations to which we're often inclined, to the power of the provider, the performer, the possessor. We need to learn and find ways, as Lynn hinted at earlier, of relinquishing our positions, our status, our power, our privilege, so that the space that we previously filled is open, inviting, so that others, particularly those who have been othered, are able to step into those spaces. As well as relinquishing, we need to learn to embrace real intimate mutual relationships. We need to find ways of encountering our neighbors across those divides. We need to find spaces where we become open to the challenge, the learning, the transformation that happens when we truly engage face to face with our neighbors. We need to learn a kind of receptivity to their voices, to their challenges and to their gifts. And all of these, I think, for people like me, are aspects of repentance. And repentance, I would argue, is the necessary precursor to reconciliation. There's a lot of talk from our political leaders as well as from our church leaders at the moment about uniting as a society. But uniting as a society is only possible if those of us with more than our fair share of resources and power and privilege and voice, undergo this hard work of relocating, resisting, relinquishing, receptivity and repentance. Otherwise, any facade of unity is false. It's a lie. It covers over the cracks that remain there. And so I want to finish by just pointing you back to the Magnificat that Lynn highlighted for us earlier, because the Magnificat is not just about exalting the humble, but also about humbling the exalted. I want to point you to the story of Zacchaeus, who in an encounter with Jesus, had to come down from his exalted hiding place and be seen, be opened up to the transformation of encounter, and in that encounter underwent the radical journey of conversion, of repentance and also reparation, making good, redistributing the wealth that he had more than his fair share of. And so I want to finish my bit with a couple of I wonder questions. I wonder how do we those of us with money, security or privilege to be comfortable enough, how do we hear the prayers of those on the margins? And wonder, how do we resist the urge to do for and speak for our other neighbours so that those neighbours are able to find the spaces, the confidence and the connections to do and to speak for themselves? Thank you so much, Al and Lynn. Um, uh, any responses or questions from anyone? Some good challenges there at the end from Al. You might have to give me a wave because I have to go across the screen. I can see Jane Jones giving a wave. Unmute yourself first, Jane. Yes, I'm thinking about what you've both said uh, in relation to our work in the cathedral. Um, we have a particular problem in the cathedral because it's seen as middle class and it's seen as um, exclusive and I've been going to the cathedral for 42 years now and when I first started coming of course it was a great deal worse but uh, gradually things have opened up a bit but I still think we have a massive amount of work to do and Jane started uh, joined us in with the system of uh, the um, uh, place of welcome and we started, just started to reach out to the sort of people we wanted to reach out to when, of course, COVID happened. And so, of course, that, that's had to go on, on ice now. But um, we are still monochrome, 
uh, still predominantly male, predominantly middle class. And I think uh, there is a perception that to come and worship in the cathedral, you have to be posh, that the cathedral is not for people, you know, ordinary people from the estates in Blaken and, and the Lake. And we have a, a massive perception problem. Uh, the uh, theologian in residence we had, um, Claire Henderson Davis, was doing fantastic work reaching out to all sorts of marginalized people. And unfortunately, when her term of office came to an end, nothing replaced it. You know, and so all that work really was, was, was again, just left undone. And I, I don't know how we address that problem, how we change perception. I mean, one thing we used to do years ago was to have an open day once a year where we could showcase all the work that was, goes on in the cathedral. And that was wonderful. You'd hear some fantastic feedback from people. But now we have all these exhibitions and we have, we have to make money. And so there's no room to have an open day, you know, and have stalls where people you know, showcase what they're doing in the cathedral. And it, it is a particular um, challenge, I think, for a cathedral. I don't have any answers. <laughs> Okay, uh, Jackie, you have to comment or question. Um, I, I think the concepts were very helpful, but the one I would um, add, and it perhaps relates to what Jane's just been talking about. Um, in the past, I've been involved in quite a lot of what you might call community work and working with people with serious mental health problems. And I uh, once uh, enabled people to very much speak to power uh, about the services. Um, and I would say that the concept of enabling needs to be added to what our speakers have said, because there's no good just stepping aside without giving, uh, enabling the tools, the confidence, the platform um, and I think that uh, if you're very honest in your approach and sincere and have that feeling that there but for the grace of God go I, or I have been there, um, because we all have different life journeys. Um, so I, I would uh, say, you know, think about how to listen, but also to enable. Don't just give space to those who perhaps are not sympathetic to where we hope to come from and to enable people to go. Thank you. Lynn, did you want to respond to Jane and Jackie together? So you're on mute, Lynn. I'm not very good with technology, Jane, so sorry. Um, yeah, I think that's a really great point from Jane. And actually, well done, Jane, for recognising that's an issue, um, uh, you know, because uh, I think lack of engagement and middle class perceptions around um, cathedrals are, um, are, are rife and, and in many cases um, well earned, really. Um, so um, I think I'd suggest a couple of things. Firstly, I think it'd be really good as part of IME when we're training um, clergy, when we've got people going through our diocesan processes, to spend at least a day or so at the cathedral each. Um, so um, I, I think that would enable people to go back to their respective parishes and especially when they're going back to estate parishes or working class parishes with more of an understanding of what the cathedral does and maybe more of a vision for what the cathedral could do and then they could come back to you with ideas that are perhaps you know more grounded in estates context or whatever I think that would be great I'd also be interested in, to to understand if you've ever done kind of a working class audit of the cathedral be quite interesting to have a group of kind of mixed and and i mean when i say working class i mean of mixed ethnicity to have a group of people come to the cathedral and just experience the the life of what it feels like for a day or so and maybe give you some very honest feedback about where they think the issues are because the problem is um we're constructivists in our learning so we layer down um, learning over the years and, and any new learning we we simply layer on top of that so 
So no matter how open-minded and broad thinking we are, I will never think like a middle class person. I will always approach it from a working class perspective. Doesn't mean to say we can't develop and learn. Of course we can, and we need to be open to that. But we are constructivists. So if you have a middle class team there, they, no matter how broad minded and, and with what goodwill, they will still be viewing things through a middle class lens. And I really would be interested in taking a, a team in and, and just getting their feedback. I think that would be really exciting, really. Thank you. Um, I think Pamela and then Nigel. Pamela, did you have your hand up? Is the question still in your head? Uh, sort of. Um, I was just wondering what what the what the uh, panel's thoughts were on um, patronage generally in the church and what role that has to play. Um, and also, you used the word. Um, is it was it yearning or or yeah, mm. yeah? I would use the word aspiration to give people aspirations, real aspirations. And I, I would I would give that to people with disability or or, or or people in poverty. But it's giving people real aspirations, something to look forward to, something to work towards, not the bottom rung. I'd put it up one. Uh, Al, do you want to speak or or should I? Um, uh, you you go first, Lim. But I, I'm forming a thought in my head at the moment. Okay. I mean, I I would say, can you give someone aspirations? So yearning is, is a, a self-generated response. I yearn for something. You don't give me a yearning. It comes from who I am and from my own heart. Aspiration, equally, I would say, needs to come from me. And I don't think I can give you an aspiration. I think I can model my own, the, the lived experience of my own aspiration, and that might act as inspirational model to you. So, so I think yearning for me is more, um, it's that kind of unspoken voice of your heart, isn't it really, yearning? Um, but I absolutely agree that life opportunities for people in poverty and in deprived areas are uh, hugely constricted. I did some work in Birkenhead some years ago about the life chances of um, young people there. And it was found from the research that by the age of four or five, that child's life chances had already been restricted by about 80%. I mean, it was absolutely incredible, um, the, the life trajectory. So I absolutely agree there are, there's work to be done on um, creating the environment for people's aspirations to be higher. I, I absolutely agree, yeah, yeah. If I could just add in, um, so yeah, Pamela, I absolutely agree, and likewise with, with what Lynn's just underlined. You know, some of this is about the bottom lines. Actually, you know, there there is there should be a flaw that everybody is entitled to uh, a, a way of of livelihood um, that that has all the basics of life at least. And part of the injustice of our society is that so many people fall beneath that floor at the moment but but equally i would want to talk about flourishing i'd want to talk about life in all its fullness which is what jesus comes to bring which which again is is a gift a promise for all of us um and that actually i, I i'm i'm less comfortable with with the word aspiration and uh, and more uh want, wanting to just highlight the way that all the resources are given to us on our planet for everybody to live life in all its fullness. And the injustice is that some people and some of us have more of our fair share of those resources to enable us to flourish and flourishing should be something for everybody. I, I just um, related to that just very quickly, you know, I, I, I uh, that, that language of giving people aspiration I, I think again I, I struggle with a bit but linked to Jackie's point I would want to talk about how can those of us with any kind of power be involved in creating spaces where people are heard to speech creating spaces where what is inside people is is able to be drawn out so that people are able to say things and be heard saying things that 
maybe they've never been able to articulate before or never believed could be possible before and begin to uh, you know, grow into that reality. How can we create those spaces? Thank you, Nigel. And I think we've got a few people here. Let's hope we've got time. So certainly someone from Thomas's iPad is the next one. So, but Nigel first, and then if we have time, Ken, definitely, Nigel. Okay, uh, right, I'll try to be very quick then. Um, there's been a problem, um, I, I'll put it down to, for a while, there was a closing of the poverty gap. It never closed completely, of course, but for a while, up till say the mid seventies, it began to close somewhat. And at that stage, we had people who had lived experience of working in mines in parliament. We, we actually had voices there. We don't have those sort of people in parliament now uh, in that kind of position. Um, so that, that that's an observation really, which can be commented upon. And I suppose I also had a wonder uh, in terms of carol services. <laughs> but I kind of thought, you know, I wonder how often um, this cathedral might have hosted carol, service for, carol services for pupils in Blaken as opposed to the King's School. Uh, you know, that the, 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 uh, maybe there's something to be thought about in how we relate to, to the communities around us. And I'll, I'll shut up there. Well, I, I can tell you we have Sing the Christmas Story, or we have had in the past, which is all the schools who have joined in with singing carols. So we do host others at the Chris Dingle service. It's just you might have only heard of the other ones, but we definitely do host lots of different carol services. Um, it's Thomas's iPad, but it looks like um, maybe your wife, Thomas. Could you unmute first? Can you, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted to say, I don't know if this is a helpful metaphor, but I see a church congregation a little bit like um, a class of school children. I used to be a teacher. And you'll always have your bright, gifted, intelligent kids who are, they've always got their hands up and they're going, me, me, choose me, choose me. And there comes a time when every teacher has to say, I'm so happy that you're so talented and clever and enthusiastic, it's lovely but could you put your hand down and let somebody else have a go? And uh, I, I just see that. And I see that in my church all the time. I think, oh, and especially when you've got people who are introverted who will sit there and they're longing to be asked, but it, it doesn't happen because these people are just jumping in all the time. And um, yeah, I don't know if that's a helpful metaphor, but it helps me anyway. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Thank you. Shall we have Ken and then we'll have a response from Lynn and Al to finish with. Yeah, I got a couple of thoughts on that. Uh, what I've been listening to, to me, relates to the race issue that we had and discussed a little while ago. And if anybody heard the book of the week on Radio 4 this morning, that's middle class. Um, there's a guy there who was a refugee and he's talking and he's now become a barrister and he's talking about the education system and the prejudice and the unseen reasons why a lot of people simply don't make it to what we would call aspirational jobs. That's one. The second is, there's reasonable research now that shows that if we do not do welcoming and opening to diverse our membership in organisations, the real price is paid by the organisation. So if we stay as we are, we're going to suffer because there'll be a price to take on that. We will need to find a formal way of getting a different variety in our decision making so that we can be asked that question. I used to work for an organisation in the health service and we had a policy that we would have on all of our committees a service user. So it wasn't just us professionals sitting around the table having mutually congregational chats. We actually had people who were using our services. And I think that might be considered as a policy for the cathedral. That all of our committees in the cathedral have service users who are not middle-class 
I used to say middle aged, but that's gone long ago. <laughs> and male and white like me. And believe it or not, I can't actually help being male and white. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Thank you. So, Alan Lynn, do you want to give a response as a final word? How do you want to go first? Okay, um, that means you can have the last word, Lynn, which is good. Oh no, um, I can go first. I'm, I mean, I'm ready to say something. I didn't know whether you wanted to. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in first and then, uh, then, then you can yeah, finish us off. Um, so I, I think for me, just a word about, uh, about the language of inclusion, um, which I think has some value because it highlights uh, who is being excluded. Mm -hmm. um, but the danger with the language of inclusion, I think, is that we, those of us on the inside, imagine that, that basically what we're doing is kind of opening the doors a bit wider, um, communicating a bit better, uh, so that those who have been excluded are able to come in and enjoy uh, the thing that we're already doing. Um, I, I prefer the language of transfusion. Um, because it, it suggests that actually the body is a bit sick. The body uh, that is, is the us already actually is in need. Um, and, and what a transfusion brings is, is a transformation and new life to that body beyond what we are familiar with, beyond what we are comfortable with. And, and actually what I think we're talking about today is how can the many, many thousands in our society who have been pushed to the edges and devalued and dehumanized and told that they're not of value, that they're not worth it, that they're not contributors to our society, that their gifts are not important. How can we discover a way of being together where those gifts are, are seen as priceless, are known as priceless, are valued just as much as the gifts of those uh, with well-established voices and, uh, and secure homes and, uh, and um, kind of well-paid careers. How can, we, how can we value those gifts, but also how can we, who are already on the inside, embrace the challenges of our neighbours in ways that come as a transfusion to us, that change us utterly. Thank you, Lynn. Um, yeah, thank you, Al. Um, the, the couple of final points from me would be to pick up the questions that were asked at the end. Um, I mean, I was reading something recently about the gentrification of members of parliament. Um, so people used to come up through the trades union process, didn't they, and now um, we have a, a hugely gentrified body, really, um, there um, in, in the UK. I, th I think the same thing goes for um, our House of Bishops. Um, you know, um, this is quite controversial, but I think the introduction of women bishops in some ways has just changed white middle class males for white middle class females. And um, I'm not sure that that's moved us forward anywhere near as much as I'd hoped. Um, and what kind of perturbs me about that is there seems to be a feeling that the job is now done um, because uh, we have women there and we have women in some numbers there. But actually, I'm not sure it's opened um, the worldview or the decision making ability any more than we had before, really. Um, the, the thing that I've noticed in terms of um, picking up the point about having a service user on your groups, I think that's great. I would say never have just one. Um, there's a whole power dynamic there um, that's quite difficult. And I think it's always good to have two or more um, if you can on groups. Um, and what I've noticed is something of a lack of class confidence, I always term it, but th there's a, a, a tendency in, in most organizations that I've worked in and, and um, been involved in certainly with the church is you get people of good heart who want to broaden up leadership and want to broaden representation they bring people in who are service users or who are um, you know from different backgrounds and that's absolutely fine but if they delegate something to them and that starts to go in a way that that person who's delegated the task or the area didn't expect 
it's immediately taken back. Whereas actually, we one thing we have to let go of is our own way, our own perceived trajectory of how everything has to be. Because there are numerous, myriad ways that things can turn out well and that can flourish, to use Alice's language. So, so it's not just letting go of our place at the table, it's also letting go of our very narrow trajectory of how things have to be and to turn out. But I absolutely love that discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Al, for the wealth of insights there, which were wonderful too. Thank you. Thank, Thank you to you as well, Lynn. Thank you so much, Lynn and Al, for leading us in that discussion. I hope people are going to go away to consider some of those questions and how it affects them in their own context. Um, since I can have the last word, I will. We have the Poverty Truth Commission, which has been running for about four years now in Chester. And we have people with lived experience who have transformed and changed such things as housing in Chester and the locality in extraordinary ways. So their voices have been heard and acted upon. Unfortunately, the funding's run out, but it was good while it lasted. But thank you very much for everything you've said to us. Thank you very much for coming everyone. And thank you for some of you who have actually come every week throughout every one of these sessions. It's been good to have you with us.